Hello and welcome to TARDIS Rubbish, where our brains are bigger on the inside but still can't contain our rubbish opinions about Doctor Who. Today, we're fresh off of watching The Church on Ruby Road, the first full adventure of Shooty Got Was Doctor, the debut of new companion Ruby Sunday, and the first Doctor Who Christmas special since 2017. I'm Josh, and joining me today, he is a frequent contributor to The Secret Origins of Mint Condition and Trash Compactor, a mostly Star Wars podcast. Welcome, John. Hey, everyone. And my longtime friend and even longer time Doctor Who fan, welcome, Guy. Hey, everybody. And an old friend from the Mint Condition days, frequent contributor to Secret Origins, making his TARDIS rubbish debut. Welcome, Jack. Hello, everyone. Thank you. Glad to be here. Before we get to the Church on Ruby Road discussion, we have a bit of a tradition here on TARDIS rubbish. Whenever someone is on for the first time, we ask them who their favorite doctor is just to establish a baseline for where everyone's opinions are coming from. John, yours was or yours is the 10th doctor, David Tennant. Yep. And still st- still is as of now, but you know, I am open to change. <laughs> and I'm liking what I'm seeing so far. And guy, you're Peter Davison, the fifth doctor? Correct. Correct. I'm a fourth doctor, Tom Baker, basic bitch. And uh so Jack, um who who is your doctor, Jack? Um, well, I would say very similar to Guy, my first doctor, the one who uh, I was introduced to was Peter Davidson. And so uh, for many, many years, uh, he was my favorite and still remains, I think, as uh, what I think is the uh, quintessential doctor. Um, but I think of New Who, uh, I am very fond of the, the Matt Smith, the 11th doctor. Um, uh, I like his stories, his energy, uh, and I think that'll tie uh, very nicely into our discussion today. Fantastic. OK, so let's get into it. The Church on Ruby Road. Um, overall thoughts, Guy? Well, uh, it it was such a breath of fresh air uh, coming out of the, the uh, Chibnall era and, uh, and piggybacking on the last three specials uh, to see absolute joy. And it wasn't angsty. It wasn't... Um, uh, I mean, I'm all for pathos and and uh, and and internal drama and struggle, but for, as a Christmas special, yes, this is like I think what I I I as an uh, American uh, think pantomime would be for uh, UK viewers and UK fans. Um, it was just fun. It was fun. It was light. Uh, th- I mean. Did I love it? I, I, I would say that there are, I, I have there. I would give it a seven and a half um, out of ten. Um, but I'm 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 really picky. I mean, I did think that there was it, it, it glossed over a lot of things, but those things where it focused like it buzz it focused in on um, really hit home, and and I, I love I, I really I really enjoyed it, and I loved the goblins. Although they were just, they were an afterthought. They were really not, they were just kind of there and there was no, like, well, I didn't, how did they get there? Who are they? I mean, this is very, this is very like Doctor Who meets fantasy. So I, I was very, I was very, as a, as a, a long time viewer and fan, I was like, so the goblins exist? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I can get my head behind that. And they aren't going to be shot down by uh, uh, F-16s and, and, and whatnot. And I, I mean, so there's a lot of like unanswered questions, but I just went around long for the rise and it was fun. It was fun. I watched it uh, twice already. Yeah, I mean, I think there's something to be said. I think we are seeing the effects of the doctor in um, Wild Blue Yonder letting myths become real uh, when he. Oh, wow. Yeah. He, um, what did he do with the salt? He he invoked a superstition, Drew a line in super, yeah, uh, yeah, on the edge of existence, and and that sort of so, so, so I think because you know, Russell T. Davies has said that this season has more of a fantasy sort of a vibe, and I'm wondering if that was sort of the, the in universe beginning of that. So you can have goblins, and you have in the giggle, the the by generation was a was a myth and you know maybe it allowed for that but allowed the toy maker 
into our reality, all that stuff. So maybe that has something to do with it. I don't know. But um, John, your overall thoughts. You know, I'm right there with you, guy. Like in, in terms of like the, the joy and the fun of it. Um, and it, I wasn't going in. I wasn't expecting like, OK, this is going to be the best masterpiece of writing that I've ever seen, especially from Russell Davies, who himself has really been upping his writing game in in the years since he left who um but it was literally everything i wanted it to be out of a christmas special especially because those can be hit or miss uh you have voyage of the damned which is the high watermark that is that is it also didn't we say the last time the highest rated or something like one of the highest rated mm-hmm. episodes of doctor who ever i mean Kelly Minogue, watched so. episode of doctor who ever yeah uh, it was really good. And then there were there, there were a few that didn't quite hit the mark. I, I remember trying to introduce somebody uh, to uh, the show, at, at, I think, at two or three of them. Uh, and, and they didn't always land. Uh, uh, and, and that was the thing. This one landed. This one really landed. Uh, and I had so much fun with it. Uh, right off the bat, I knew, I knew from the previews what one of the early scenes was going to be, which is the Doctor dancing. Um, it had it had this vibe that was very, I know it, it was. It was Russell Davies hearkening back to queer as folk, uh, but specifically the, 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 there were these sort of like dance montages in those episodes. And it was always meant to be, uh, depending on the, you know, I guess the context, but it was meant to be this like moment where you get to see somebody. You get to see them without the rest of the, you know, things that shackle them as a character or the writing, they're just able to move and be an experience. So we got that, which is really unique for the Doctor, because usually it's just, he's situational. Which crisis is it? Who? Which companion? Which problem's going on? This was the Doctor sort of doing his thing, but also ready the second that drink fell, and is there to catch it because, oh, yeah, no, he's still on the clock. He still knows what's going on. And like, yeah, okay, something weird is going on. And from then on, I was like, I was sold. I was there. Um, and it was fun. Goblins, yeah, I totally believe it. They weren't really there or not, you know, was the, was the thing. So, you know, they, I guess Radar couldn't pick them up, you know, because they were sort of on the borders <laughs> of uh, of reality, which which led to the the best line about them, which was something to the effect of, uh, you know, are they time travelers? <laughs> They're not time travelers. Time travelers are like the best, like, wow. <laughs> and you're like, oh, okay. Okay. This doctor, he's feeling himself like this, this, this is going to be, this is going to be a ride. So I enjoyed, I enjoyed the whole thing, you know, through and through. Um, and it was what I wanted out of Christmas special. Now I'm waiting. Now I just want the season to start. I'm like, I want to see where they're going with this, what they're going to do. Um, so, yeah, seven and a half, maybe, maybe for me an eight out of ten in terms of the experience. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, is it the best dramatic episode? No. But a good intro. And does anybody else think there were definitely vibes of um, the original reboot premiere? Uh, uh, it, it sort of felt like the mannequins, it, it, the way he encountered Rose the first time. It just sort of, the, that, that quick introduction, like it just it sort of felt like we were a little bit going back to 2005 um, stylistically. Yeah, well, it's interesting because this is sort of a soft reboot of the show. It's for a new audience, for the Disney Plus audience, the international global audience. Yeah, it's very consciously from the perspective of the new companion sort of introing us to the world of the Doctor rather than, you know, more recent companion introductions and even Doctor introductions. They just sort of assume that everything on the show is a known quantity, so they don't go through the like, okay, here's this, and then they establish this, and then they establish this. Mm. So yeah, I think it was definitely designed very similarly to Rose. But Jack, what were your your overall thoughts on this episode? Um, Thank you, Josh. Um, I I enjoyed it a great deal. I I felt the energy was very high. Uh, And to to John's point, I I definitely feel um, it captured what historically I've appreciated uh, about the Christmas specials. Um, insofar as there was just a lot of energy, um, there was a lot of go, go, go. Uh, but it was very focused in what it was trying to accomplish. Um, and so I truly appreciated that. Um, I also appreciated, um, and I apologize, I hadn't seen um, the, uh, the the giggle uh, at the point of the previous recording, but I have seen it. Um, I appreciate even with the, you know, uh, by regeneration, uh, they, this new iteration of the Doctor 
didn't have that kind of lost or, or conflicted uh, aspect that new generations, the, the, the first outing of the doctor typically has. Um, you know, um, you know uh, we can honestly say that Shutui uh, Gatwai just kind of just embodied this is who I am and I'm just going to move forward without having to sit back. And, and on one level, I think uh, that was really uh, prescient of, you know, Russell T. Davies to actually split them and then essentially leave uh, the 14th doctor with all of the angst uh, and then allows this doctor to move forward very freely. Um, and so that we can just in go for the ride. And I think, again, uh, as we said, introducing it to the Disney Plus audience and to uh, a broader global audience, uh, it doesn't necessarily hold us down with all of that baggage. Um, but I, I also agree, it's very similar to, in, in tone, uh, it seemed to me to be a mashup of kind of uh, the Shakespeare Code and Rose. Uh, and uh, the aspect of Rose is obviously you have the, the new companion who has uh, a full backstory uh, in their life um, that you were introduced to within the course of the episode. And so you become vested in them, uh, not just from the perspective of following the doctor, but this is a full, real life, fully realized human being fully realized uh, parents uh, and uh, everyone around them uh, that, uh, at, including a mystery, which is something else we'll get to in a minute, um, that really kind of vests you directly into the new companion. Um, and obviously, again, introduction of goblins, uh, that, mis uh, that mythical aspect of it all uh, did remind me of the Shakespeare Code because, uh, you know, the, the, the doctor current... Uh, occasionally refer to their technology uh, as rope. He speaks, you know, the language of ropes. Uh, and, and within the Shakespeare Code, uh, it was uh, essentially the incantations was their technology. Uh, and here it was coincidence. Um, and, and, and so I, I just love that kind of playing around uh, with things that we see as very mundane in our own daily lives, uh, but in the Doctor Who realm, in the Doctor Who, in the Who-niverse, uh, the Who-verse, as it were, um, they really kind of say, well, what would uh, this, how would this appear? to uh, either a uh, different uh, life form that perceives of life uh, and interactions in a different way. And so I thought that, again, was very fascinating. And I look forward to seeing more of that. No, I love that also. Like, it's such a big idea. And that's something that Doctor Who does really well. They just casually slip in these huge ideas that are mind-blowing and far-reaching. And it's all in service of getting you from A to B. It's like, no, the show's not about that necessarily it's just the most interesting way to get from from a to b um i i love this i don't know i went in like not not that i didn't have expectations i had expectations but they weren't they were tempered especially because it's a christmas special and like you said john the christmas specials i think can be hit or miss and they're also written a little differently for a Christmas Day audience where you have to assume that more than just fans are watching and, you know, at least half the audience is a little uh, drunk. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, so they're usually a bit sillier and broader. The only real kind of aspect of that that I could detect was the uh, the Goblin musical number, which I'm fine with. I don't know how I feel about it. Like on its own, I really enjoy it. But in the context of the show, I was kind of like it was... It was sort of a bum note, though. I love how they released the single and then when it played out in the episode, they go even further and the doctor and Ruby join in. I was like, what is this? This is so cool. <laughs> um, and they were really good. I have to wonder, like, so so Ruby's in a band, yes. right? So is that was that kind of seeding the fact that she had some musical ability? Because it seemed like very... Like, oh, it's a good thing that the two of them can just freestyle like this on their feet because, <laughs> because uh, um, I might be making something out of nothing here, but I have to wonder if that's not something that might play into, there's a mild spoiler here, so anyone who, who wants to be completely unspoiled, cover your ears for the next 12 seconds. But there is a musical episode in this season. I wonder if there's going to be some kind of a callback to some explanation to like how they're just able to to burst into song. Sing. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, probably not. Though we did get a Mavity reference. So not everything's yes, a throwaway. We did. Oh, wow. You know, <laughs> so I, that, I missed that one. That's enduring. I, 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 I took note of that immediately. I was like, Mavity again. Oh, 
Oh, they really the, did mess up the timeline. Like they're just, they're, they're just rolling with this one. <laughs> the one thing I thought was funny though with the band is, and it's it's so very subtle. Is you know they refer back to the uh, the lead singer and they say Janice, and I was like, oh, Janice Goblin. I was like, that is so cute. Um, but I it missed is, that. Oh, but it, but it was so. I was like, okay, I like that a lot. So because it was so subtle but very well thought out. You know, it's funny. I think Russell T Davies on Instagram said recently that he didn't think of Janice Goblin and that was something that someone brought to his attention. Like he named it Janice. Oh wow. <laughs> but it took someone else to be like Janice Goblin and he was like, "Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, that is good." <laughs> um yeah, so so I loved it. Like I wasn't expecting to love it as much as I did. Um I loved Shooty's doctor, you know, he's he's much more, I think, overtly emotional, yet still very doctorish. Like he's still he's still up to something. He's still aloof. He's still operating on a different level. Can I ask you guys who did you watch it with, or did you watch it alone? Because uh, I had a situation. Oh, <laughs> oh I see. I I see. I touched yeah. the nerve here. Because uh, yeah. I had a situation. I wanted my partner to watch it with me. And her mother is here, who who I knew wouldn't wouldn't like it. Um, so I was like, should I just wait until everyone goes to sleep and watch it myself, or should I, or should I be like, hey everyone, let's all watch this together? Which I eventually decided to do that because that's what the special is designed to do. It's supposed to be Christmas Day viewing for the whole family. So I was like, don't overthink it. Um, my partner fell asleep, and her mom decided to go read a book instead. So I ended up kind of watching it by myself. <laughs> So it was fine. Oh. Um, but anyway, so who'd you guys watch it with? I also watched it with my partner and his mother, and who has never, I, I don't think she's ever heard of Doctor Who or she knew of Doctor Who before uh, stepping foot into our apartment. And I said, you know, she, she was really excited to uh, watch the latest Mission Impossible movie. And I said, <laughs> but first, but first, I want you to watch this. And it went, shoo, it went yeah. over her head. So for for a newbie in in her sixties, who really was hoping to just watch, see Tom Cruise blow up some things and punch some people, As one this does. was not for her. Uh, my 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 partner uh, loved it. I, he 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 gave it a, an eight out of ten. Mm. Um, his uh, he I, well, when we get to it, I have a I have a a theory from him which i think is not so far-fetched considering the it, it is doctor who so mm. but uh yeah I, I watched it with those two and it was interesting so that's why i had to watch it immediately after she left i have to i had to watch it again so yeah well it's, i watched it i i i was considering trying to rope my entire family into it um mm. but i was like no this that's too much of a pull and the kids are way, way, way too young. Mm. Um, but if it if they'd all been a couple of years older, I might have been like, yeah, "This, this is this is Christmas. This is a Christmas special." And I, I would use some machinations and, and made it happen because I think it would have been I would think it would have been fun. Uh, but so uh, when I got home uh, from Christmas, I was like, "All right, I got to watch this." Uh, uh, you know, I'm gonna. It's like, it's like I have a job to do here, um, and it was a really nice way to wind down the night, actually. Um, and it was. It's something that I I think I would, I think you could you could get somebody you know I think a kid five and older could appreciate. Um, I think sixteen older, no, yeah, no, if they've never if they've never been part of uh, Doctor Who or, or had any connection to it. Um, but I I really do want to know as a result both how many people watched it uh, on Christmas Day, how many people are watching it the days after, um, <clears throat> and. Uh, what the demographics are because i i can see this i can see this you know opening up to a new audience but it definitely felt like something that you could you could at least watch with somebody without having to be like all right let me explain literally everything it was just sort of enough of its own self-contained it was enough of a just sort of a, it was just a romp on its own but without needing a lot of other you know explanation uh, although if you're going to watch with me you're going to get it anyway so you know you're screwed <laughs> Um, well, for me, um, since typically my family and I live out of the country, we have not had access to Disney Plus. And so obviously when we came back about two weeks ago, uh, we've just been binge watching so many things. Uh, and for me, I was very excited to uh, obviously watch the, the specials. 
Um, and so I invited the entire family to watch the specials as I watched them. I kind of started watching Wild Blue Yonder uh, with my youngest son. And again, I think that is way too, uh, almost a meta commentary on Doctor Who uh, for a 12 year old to really grasp. Uh, and so then even things with the Christmas special, uh, obviously he was not so engaged that he would have seen Giggle. Uh, and so then the Bi Regeneration would have been completely lost as to, well, we just saw it and it was this other person. And now it's this new person. Um, so again, as, as you said, Josh, I, I waited till everyone goes to sleep uh, and then I, I can just sit uh, and watch comfortably uh, and have my own thoughts and opinions. Uh, but it, it's definitely something I think of all of the uh, pop culture um, that I enjoy. Uh, Doctor Who, I think, is the one that is furthest away or furthest removed from my family. I mean, uh, everyone goes along for the ride for the MCU. Everyone goes along for the ride for, um, you know, uh, obviously Star Wars. Uh, bits and pieces of Star Trek, particularly the Kelvin, uh, the Kelvin verse, um, and 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 Doctor Who just seems almost solitary. My own uh, little piece of uh, enjoyment that no one I think can really understand. They recognize I like it. I mean, obviously, I have a I have a, a TARDIS throw uh, rug, uh, throw uh, throw cover, uh, and so everyone knows I've got a little mini TARDIS uh, that I have on my my, my desk at home. Uh, but uh, it's just kind of well, that's just kind of you know Jack or Dad's thing. So yeah. Why do you? Um, because I get what you're saying, but I'm wondering why do you think that is? Is it the combination of the fact that the show is a little more out there in terms of it's not it's not pretending to be beholden to some kind of reality um combined with the fact that it's a particularly british sensibility so i think maybe the two make it a little less accessible i'm not sure i'm not sure do you guys have any thoughts on why that is so, you know, I, I think that's a really good question. And I've thought about this. And so, for instance, um, you know, I, with my partner, we watch um, Slow Horses. And obviously that's BBC produced. Um, and we both enjoy that, like, a great deal. Um, you know, it, it, uh, it's very exciting. Obviously, it's very British. Um, but it's very entertaining and a very conventional, you know, guy, to your point, uh, Mission Impossible. There's a, there's a, there's a task, there's an operation uh, that they're, they are supposed to perform. Uh, we've even watched, um, you know, Killing Eve, uh, which, again, kind of uh, has a, a very strong kind of British influence on it, irrespective of the fact that Sandra Oh is the main character. Um, it primarily takes place uh, with a very European feel. Um, my thought on it, um, and on one level, uh, just to kind of list all of the, you know, pop culture media that I've listed before, is I think Doctor Who has the, has a lot of established world building that's a very difficult to jump into. Um, but also the ground rules are much looser uh, than many of the other established media. I, I think uh, if you start from the MCU, it is just very grounded in what the rules are. There are superheroes and by extension, supervillains. Um, their motivations may not necessarily be very strong, but, you know, the fact that they exist is they will conflict. Um, and, you know, then also going into Star Wars, very similar. You have Jedi and you have Sith uh, along the same lines. The conflict is the nature of the storytelling that you have. Star Trek, I think, also becomes a bit more difficult because there is no primary antagonist that they confront. Obviously, you have different alien species, all of them ostensibly reflections of us as humans. Um, but there is no central goal that they're trying to achieve. They're just out there doing things. And when it comes to Doctor Who, once you factor in the fact that this is uh, an individual who is millions, some might even assume, depending on how you age him, billions of years old, um, who uh, has various different iterations, sole purpose is to do good, who can also travel through time, that becomes a very squirrely logic uh, that mm. is difficult to kind of explain to someone in a way that is easy for them to understand if they don't already have that backstory built in. I don't know what everyone else thinks about that. I think that's uh, been a problem in the past getting in, getting people into Doctor Who has been that it has not only the mythos, but it has a like a, a cultural vibe that seems unapproachable to some people. Uh, e even I felt that um, before the 2005 reboot, it felt very removed and specific because it, it ended in 89. I'd seen the TV special, which was accessible to me because it was very Americanized, very 90s, um, but it didn't go anywhere. 
And uh, it always felt like, oh, that was that thing from that time uh, that has a very specific feel to it, a very specific vibe to it, a very, very, very Britishness to it. Um, and so I could recognize the like the symbols of Doctor Who and be like, oh, that's what that was. Um, but it never drew me in personally because it wasn't wasn't that accessible over here, you know, uh, you know, in, in the States by comparison to what it is now, um, at least not in the 90s. And it just so, so, so it was there. 2005, uh, Josh, I forget how we we got into it. I I think we we were watching it before it was easily accessible here. You were you were you were giving me the the, the DVDs of like this is the new Doctor Who. So it's like okay, let me let, let me try this out, and boom, I was in. Then it started airing here about a year about a year late, um, and uh, or at least a couple at least a couple months late, and it it felt a lot more. Ex- accessible to me the way that this one felt accessible and i think that was what he did in this episode was he didn't say okay let's focus heavily on the mythos let's just go let's just go show the characters doing their thing everyone's going to catch up because we're not going to go too deep we're just going to go have some have some fun with it um and then and that sort of worked for me so i i think this should be accessible to people who who want to get into it um I just I I don't know what the uh, what the audience is going to be for this show. I'm, I'm really curious to see what 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 they're doing with Disney. Um, one thing I did remark about while watching it was I said, "Wow, I can I can tell the Disney production value to this. I can tell um, a lot of things." Mm-hmm. But warning in the back of my head, this was green lit in the uh, Chapek era of Disney when Bob Chapek was CEO and Bob Iger's come in and he's. I mean, I will not say the bad guy's name. We all know Warner Brothers Discovery. Uh, but he's following in his footsteps, uh, Bob Iger is, and is sort of cutting things. So I wonder how much slack he's going to give the show in terms of, well, how long does it have to establish an audience? Um, I think if anything was going to establish an audience, it's this this type of uh, vibe to it um, with the new Doctor. I think, I think uh, 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 should he got one in particular, nails a an accessibility and a fun and an interest that that is gonna is gonna expand that out because i didn't feel like i had to know who this person was i just oh he's he's a doctor and oh he's he's out there he can he can do stuff and i think the fans are gonna be the ones who are gonna be you know the long-term fans be like wait that's what a sauna screwdriver looks like now or what's going on with this what's going on with that (laughs) a lot a lot of questions but i i really hope that it's just accessible enough to get some new people into it does anybody know I thought that they made a lot of inroads into the U.S. audience with the uh, 11th Doctor, Matt Smith. Um, and I don't know whether that yeah. was because of marketing or not, but it felt like that was very, that did break its way into culture. And all of a sudden, people were referring to him and the Doctor. And I was like, wait, you don't watch the show? What are you talking about? You know? Yeah. Yeah, well, that was very intentional. I mean, it was it was marketing. And, you know, I think the problem is, the same problem that happened to the classic show originally is that it 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 goes on long enough it starts to become more self-referential and about its own lore and it becomes inaccessible so uh so you know think about that first meth smith year that was 2010 that's that's almost a decade and a half ago seven eight nine seasons of a show later it becomes kind of inaccessible again um so i think it's really savvy to reboot the show start out with a rose-like introduction where you don't have to know anything um again it's from a new companion's point of view and you're introduced to all of the elements this is being referred to as it's being marketed as season one even though which i found very strange given everything else that they're doing disney plus was was advertising this special as special four yeah i saw that just seems like a baffling decision if every other decision made seems to flow from this idea that they want it to be new viewer friendly and feel like this is a good jumping on point so it's just like why would you call it special four so you're saying okay i have to watch these other three specials first that are hugely reliant on knowledge of what has come before i found that to be very odd but I mean, who am I? I don't. I don't work in the in the Disney marketing department. Uh, nobody asked me. Well, they should. Yeah. Well, uh, 
You know, the other thing, too, that just occurred to me while you guys were talking, you know, Doctor Who is really, it's kind of a workout for your imagination. The things that they, that the show asks you to just take for granted and go with, unless rope? you have, right, exactly, the language <laughs> of rope, uh, which, um, you know, sounds like a very gentle uh, BDSM uh, uh, movie. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, like, if you think about it, you just have to go with certain things and be on board with the explanation or the implications that the introduction of this new idea has for you to just enjoy the story as a regular, you know, 45 minutes of storytelling. And I think for some people, it's too out there. It's too much. It's like, what do you mean the language of rope? Well, like, I was glad my um, my partner was asleep for that because I knew that I I would have had to pause the show and like have a very long, like 25 minute discussion about what that means and why ultimately it doesn't matter. Can we just keep watching the show? <laughs> discussion. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I don't know. Do you want to talk a little bit more about this new doctor and what he's like and how we felt about him? Can I, I, he is so like when he's on screen, I can't look away. I mean, he's magnetic. Yes, yes, I'm gay, but I'll fight any heterosexual man who disagrees that this man is super attractive. He's, I mean, he's a very good-looking like, man. Yes, okay, so I won't have to fight you, Josh. <laughs> Fantastic! <laughs> I was looking forward to it, though. You you got the word there. It's ma- ma- magnetic. It's there are magnetic. Uh, yeah. Uh, I was listening to Patrick Stewart's uh, uh, autobiography, and he was talking about an early career thing, like going up against somebody who was very handsome and very cute. And he said, "Well, I'm sort of glad I wasn't because when you're cute, the 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 expectations on you are all front loaded, and you have nowhere to go but down. Uh, when you're not, and he's sort of referring to himself, you know. You, you have, and and I thought, yeah, I mean, you can, you can be hot." You can be you can be attractive or or whatever, and that that that'll get you in the door. That might get some fans to be like, "Oh yeah, let me go." One. And you know, and th- there's a right there. Fan fiction will go there. <laughs> you to actually have the magnetic quality is something else, and that's what we're seeing on screen with this. Is where you it's like, "Oh, oh yeah, yeah," and 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 has the has the whimsy of the doctor, has the gravity too, and or. or I mean, am I supposed to say Mavity? Is, is, is that the appropriate <coughs> in-universe term now? Uh, because yeah, absolutely, you have to say Mavity. They're, they're, they're sticking with it. God, if I start doing that, I'm going to end up doing it in the real world, and that's just going to happen. <laughs> um, <laughs> they're messing with us there. But he does have that quality uh, about him, and, that, and, that, and that's so much fun to see is that it's the doctor. There, th- there's a depth. There's a weight to it. Um, but there's also a, a, a fun and a brightness, and this is something that... Um, I think every doctor's had to some degree or another, you know, b- brought that element. But to have it uh, there, I I hope again that that's appreciated. Um, and I don't know, I can probably just go with this for a couple seasons and be absolutely delighted. I I think both what you know Guy and John have said are are, are both spot on um, with respect to not only the, uh, the actor uh, but the characterization. Uh, I think fully engaging, uh, magnetic, uh, excellent way to describe him. And, you know, my concern, you know, as an African-American man, um, is shortly after introducing the first female doctor, they're now introducing the first doctor of color. And there are obviously uh, a lot of risks associated with that, uh, particularly considering uh, the Chibnall area was not necessarily as well regarded as some of the others. Um, And on one level, I don't know if Harris Dead B or Russell T. Davies, and I know that, you know, Shoot B was not available, and this is the reason why uh, they went with uh, the regeneration of the former 10th to become the 14th, uh, obviously bringing back fan favorite David Tennant, um, made sense from a practical standpoint, but I think also from uh, a sociocultural perspective, um, you almost kind of need to create some distance between the first female doctor uh, from an era that is not as necessarily well regarded, um, bringing back a fan favorite uh, so everyone mm-hmm. can kind of, at least all of the returning fans can come back on board uh, before you would go to the first doctor of color um, who has uh, their own kind of unique exuberant personality in a way that uh, balances uh, a lot of the expectations. And so I think from a production value or production uh, perspective of how or why they did it, it makes sense, um, but I also think it 
it works. Um, and that, I think, probably would have been something very difficult to try to achieve um, if shortly after, um, you know, Jodie Whittaker, uh, they would have gone to shoot me um, as, as the doctor. I think on some level, uh, you have a lot of entrenched uh, fandom who would have seen, well, uh, this is now, and I'm sure they still exist, um, Doctor Who has gone woke. Uh, there's nothing here for me. But uh, I, I think uh, it was done in a very smart and intelligent way. That's so well put, Jack. That's because I, I think you're absolutely right. It was a way that the producers and 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 I think Davis himself was like, how do we how do we um, deal with a with with, with a cultural moment we're in? And, and he's reading it because it's different than the moment we were in in 2005 different than the moment when he when he left the show and he's had to navigate them from the standpoint of a um white gay cis male and 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 he's been very good at that in the in the things that he's done with that uh from queer as folk onwards um and you know it's, it's funny i'm thinking about what you're saying and josh you sent uh the video around the bbc uh, uh, was showing sort of a retrospective on uh, Russell Davis' career, and uh, you know, so, no, so, I didn't so, send that around. I have no idea how you uh, how you watched it. Uh, you just sent you, you just sent a link to the BBC. It was it, 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 it was totally totally accessible to to us Americans. Um, yeah, we all flew to the UK and we watched iPlayer. That's uh, that's that's exactly clips. how we did it. Just clips. Uh, but I but I thought it showed like the, the advancement of a writer, but also somebody who has been writing in a way that is trying to nail the you know what the cultural vibe is going on and we live in a really difficult one right now this is this is so radically different than the world we thought we would be in and the world that we sort of started the reboot of doctor who in 2005 um and so it it, it was considered you know it, it, it was both shocking and a lot to see captain jack as an out gay character and there was the typical outcry but it was the typical outcry it, 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 it was it was the usual suspects coming out of the woodwork to say, oh, my God, I can't believe they're doing this on Doctor Who because they've been doing that since 64. There, there were always objections. Uh, it was mostly about it being too scary for kids or too violent or or too th – th there were liberal progressive ideas in there. Or I, th I think the big controversy was, was too pro-union or unionist or so something. Uh, and who knows? Maybe there was a standpoint they took on the monarchy that I don't know about at some, some point. But the era we're in now feels like – People are waiting on bated breath to freak out about something. And I, when, when I do check in my masochistic way the comment boards on the show, I see a lot of love for these specials. I haven't really d done a deep dive into this one yet, but I see a lot of love for it. And then a lot of, you know, those angry comments, but they're all coming from the same place, which is like, oh, they're just waiting. They're just waiting to use the word woke. They're waiting to be angry at something. And I sort of wonder what are, what are those types of fans or those types of viewers doing with their lives is there anything left for them to love they they feel like there mm -hmm. isn't but they're like do you actually love anything because you didn't have a problem 15 or 20 years ago but we, we've been programmed with that so on the production side you have to almost cut some loss and say yeah literally no matter what we do we're going to lose some people and probably gain some others and uh, i think the vibe i'm getting from this is that they're really trying to just say well we're going to go in the woke direction if you can even call something that um but we're just going to go in the actual direction of where the world is going and make a good show i think that was that was the difficulty the tribunal era was that we're going to say okay first female doctor this is great and then it just really sucks that the production quality was lagging as the bbc pull, began to pull its enthusiasm and the writing wasn't good. So you had a double whammy, which leads you to believe, oh, that they went woke, they went broke. It's like, no, they just were a show that was on for a while and it got weak. And that's just really bad timing to 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 try to bring in the first female doctor. And Jack, you nailed it with that. Like this could have been the the same problem is that, you know, how you introduced audiences to a new doctor. Uh, in the first place, a new doctor of color, a new doctor who's going to represent, you know, have to take on the mantle of that because that's how we always do it in our culture as well. That they're the avatar for that entire group. It's like, well, they're actually an actor playing a role, and that's really, you know, you know, have fun of that as a viewer. But you can't deny the the the, you know, the weight that is on their shoulders. So, I think from 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 the actor standpoint, brilliant. From the producer's standpoint, the writing standpoint, all done. Because to me, it was it, again it was a transparent shift over to another doctor of like, oh yeah, this just feels like a right 
like way to do the journey. This is just what what I wanted. And it's and again, we go back to that word fun, not not in a diminishing way in the reason for the show. It was fun mm-hmm. and we can probably go into it. It was also emotional because it went there too. It went it went the entire thing about fostering uh, before even the timeline shift where it got dark. Um, it really was that heartfelt notion of people and, and being- And do you say the term foundling as well? Um, I yes, think it was very well yes. Done. What did you think? Like I, I had heard that only most recently on The Mandalorian. I, I hadn't heard that. I, I, I didn't realize that that was, that was commonly used right. sort of a British phrase for that. And that it's is a very not- antiquated term. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's also very interesting because it's directly engaging with some of the um, largest changes or additions to the lore from the Chibnall era. This idea that the doctor exactly. was a foundling and now all of a sudden, um, you know, Russell T. Davies is very savvily engaging with the thematic stuff that was recently introduced by, you know, constructing a whole companion whose identity and backstory is very similar. He ties that into the new backstory of the doctor that the doctor also doesn't know who their parents were or where they came from. I thought was really, um, it's doing a lot to rehab the Chibnall era in my mind. I'm not a huge fan of the Chibnall era. I think that it had its heart in the right place. I stayed quiet in terms of not, I didn't feel like I wanted to contribute any more criticism in certain online spaces uh, because I knew that I would be speaking on the same side of people whose reason for criticizing the show I found morally repugnant and abhorrent. So so I was just like, you know what, I don't need to throw any fuel on that fire. I'll just watch the show and and not enjoy it as it turned out. Um, <laughs> It is possible to watch something, not like it, and not talk about it on the internet. I don't know if <laughs> the rest of the world knows this. Yeah, but Wait. I discovered it. It's <laughs> it's possible. Yeah, I've become discouraged with with uh, there are there are some like YouTube sites that I I, I frequented, and and li- you know every time they, I I'll, I'll disagree, I'll agree, but it's interesting to watch their take on certain aspects of fandom. And then I've seen the the, the amount of vitriol uh, against uh, not only Chibnall era, but now these three specials, Doctor Who is dead. I have not seen anything. I've not even gone because it's gonna. It's just useless to go to, to see what these people are are spouting now. And I think though that contrary and being contrarian and being argumentative and being combative is more exciting and more um with with more more people are 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 prone to look at an accident happening or an argument or a fight happening than they are two people hugging um that's why i'm just wondering you know you know you know uh yeah i think you know he who screams the loudest gets noticed more and i think those there, there's a there's a certain fandom that screams you know this is wrong this is blah. anyway that, that just it's, it's frustrating to me it, it it is frustrating and it's it's funny so it's like like that josh says oh well there's a thing called watching something and not you know just going Shouting off on everything made. Um, but that's not the world. And, and then I thought, well, well, that's the world we're on. Well, we're literally in it right now with each other right now. Um, but when the show was rebooted, that was 2005. That was the year after Facebook was founded. That was the uh, year before YouTube was bought by Google. Uh, the world changed fundamentally right about that point. Uh, in terms of the way social media shaped the way we want to express ourselves, but also the way it makes us angry. And that's why, so again, that's why I think actually for any flaws that you can see in it, Russell Davies is great at writing because 2005, who was all about reality TV in an episode or two, like they just, he just drove the point home with the introduction of Captain Jack's episode. I remember that when I was like, oh my God, this is such like, such uniquely British satire against uh, the the onslaught of reality TV, which was taking over the airwaves both here and in the UK, and that was a very you know 
on the spot a, a dick type. Well, now you have the giggle, which is what we're talking about right now, which is you said a guy, everybody wants to be right. They want to be yelling louder than each other. Uh, they're not really interested in sitting down to uh, watch a show on Christmas, enjoy it and be like, hey, that was pretty good. Yeah, that was pretty good. And maybe like like we would in the mint condition days, we would. Oh, God, Jack, there was one conversation I'm trying to remember. But I remember you you went on the most brilliant like lecture for about 20, 25 minutes deconstructing some comic book thing. And but it was so much fun. What There was no hostility. This was, we are going to go so deep into it. We're going to deconstruct it. This might have sucked. This might have been great. But there was a joy to that entire experience. And the uninitiated of us learned. That was that was the brilliance of those years. Um, if it's, you know, we weren't there to, like, yell at each other about it. Um, like, well, now that you like Doctor Who, I can't be your friend anymore. No, we were just like, right. <laughs> enlighten me, you know? I'm looking forward to... Um this new doctor and, and the way forward, um, I think for a many long time, uh, fans, uh, the return of Russell T Davies, I think was, uh, ironically almost a breath of fresh air, um, because we know, uh, his ability to, uh, as a showrunner manage all of the disparate uh, aspects of the scripts, uh, and the overall storyline in a way that, uh, will yield just a beneficial result. Uh, and so, uh, I think the show is in a very good place. I, I, I feel the Christmas special really um, serves as a very good jumping on point for a lot of new fans. And, and also, I think for existing fans, uh, our ability to kind of come back and say, OK, this is uh, even though uh, and I think it's very bold. And I think we've discussed uh, maintaining some of the things that Chibnall, some of the controversial things uh, that Chibnall introduced. But. I respect a writer who is willing to work within that storyline as opposed to completely denying it because uh, that I think is the depth of good storytelling and the depth of good world building. And I look forward to see how um, Russell T Davies kind of incorporates that in a way that makes this doctor uh, not only uniquely their own, but also uh, allows the entirety of the history um, come forth in a way that is not overbearing uh, and yet still relevant. You know, you're right. It was kind of a breath, a breath of fresh air to have Russell T. Davies come back, which is ironic because he should be the old guard. But like you pointed out last week, John, I think it was you. One of the most amazing things about Russell T. Davies is that he has been evolving in terms of not just his style of writing, but also he's still adapting. He's still learning. He's still interested in trying new things. And, you know, frankly, he had just come off of of doing it's a sin which was huge in the uk and he could have done he could have chosen whatever project he wanted to do and he went back to doctor who which says to me that he definitely has some stuff he wants to say and wants this you know megaphone to be able to say it again so 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 i think like um my issue with the chibnall era and i hate it really pains me to slag off the Chibnall era because it's really hard to write and it's really hard to make stuff. And I think that just, you know, making something is an accomplishment worthy of celebration. Um, but my main issue with the Chibnall era was the aboutness was missing. I didn't know what the show was about. I didn't know what it was trying to say. It, it made a lot of superficial decisions, but there was no core of aboutness there it just it just it just wasn't working on any other level beyond playing with the lore but that's not inherently it's not inherently interesting to play with lore unless you're using it to make a point or to tell a story and that's what for me was lacking in the Chibnall era unless it just you know was there and it went over my head which is entirely possible as well um but you know something that really struck me watching the church on ruby road last night was how well developed ruby's family was and you know that's really a hallmark of russell t davies tenure on the show he always really gives the companions family um really makes them feel like real people and really sketches out these incredibly um realistic 
and evocative situations. And my favorite scene in the episode was it was right after Ruby disappears from the timeline and the doctor had that conversation with her mother in the kitchen where she's holding the baby and she's explaining why this new alternate version of herself would never want to have a child. And it just felt so like that was a real character saying something really real and sad and profound. So I was really into that. And then it cuts back to Shooty and he does this thing where he's crying. So I was like, seeing this new side of this new doctor where he's he's very to like the other doctors generally hide the emotions that they're feeling and he just is sort of so so feeling he can't he can't even hide it he's just he he's feeling it and he's letting it out and i was like wow like this scene is really good the but the point of what i'm saying is that you know seemingly effortlessly Russell T. Davies creates this world of characters for this new companion where, you know, I was invested. I'm involved. I like the grandmother. She's awesome. She needs to get yes. the tea, goddammit. That's, she was awesome. that's like something that I just feel like was missing from the Chibnall era and even the Moffat era. I mean, it was there, but not to the same degree. He also is able to sketch out interesting characters, but it's usually because he would give them some sort of a zany hook. But compared to like Yaz's family, for example, as a writer, as a creative person, I'm trying to figure out why this was so much more impactful and got me so much more invested versus seeing Yaz's family a few seasons ago. And I'm just like, I, I don't care. I mean, that's a little harsh. Like in that episode, like that was a good episode. But yeah, like what is the difference? Why is one so impactful, so effective and the other one's not? I can't I can't quite figure it out. That's a really good. That's a really question. There are very distinct characters, like the mother and the grandmother and 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 Ruby and the three together. I think also because there's three of them and and Yaz's family, there's so many. I mean, there's the sister mom and dad or is it two the grandmother yeah um so i mean maybe, maybe that's why but uh they, they, you you got a sense immediately of who these people are you know and just the comments of like why they lived in the the, the attic apartment versus moving one floor down i mean a line just a one line can say so much into their uh their ec- economic situation and and who they are but just and it just but and then just all those pictures on the refrigerator. It's just like visual clues that, you know, help tell the story too. I mean, it was a very, very inviting, cozy, bright uh apartment with the lights and the Christmas tree. And then contrasted to the the moment where reality switched and it was like done in like a blue cold filter and everything was like just off. But uh, but yeah, I think Russell has he, he's just let's just admit the guy has got it. He's not an up um, and coming writer or, or artist. He's he he he's he's got it, and he's amazing at what he does. And I, as a as a fan and as a viewer, I feel blessed to have somebody of his caliber and his running the ship. And his attention to flippant detail and his care of incidental characters. But the police officer, the police yeah. officer. Yeah. Another you great got scene. a sense that was that this guy, you, I like this guy. I want to see this police officer again. I want to see him get married. I mean, <laughs> in, in a minute, I got a sense of who this guy was. And that's all down to to the writing and also the care. The care for what other people might see is is not important as taking the unimportant and making it important. I, I yeah, I just I'm a fanboy right now. I <laughs> Russell P. Davies is is it's just fantastic. And I'm so glad he's back. You say it so well because I was one of the no- that was one of the first things I sort of like jotted down and I was like all right, let's make some notes for the first time I watched this episode. Is 
the the engagement scene, the the, the police officers. I was like, yeah, that was really really cool. And then and then the, the doctor's long but really quick explanation for how he figured it out, you know, uh, and and then like ran through the stats. But it, that was a moment where I was instantly like, oh, this is gonna be this is gonna be good. This is gonna be intense. Um, but I, I didn't realize it until you, you just sort of both framed it that way, was that I care about the people on screen and I'm thinking back to the previous shows. Um, and I think that uh, uh, there's a lot of, you know, when you go back to some of the earlier shows like Queer as Folk, you, there's a lot to be like, there's cringeworthy, like, oh, the, you know, from, from quality or some writing things because we have 20 years later, uh, uh, everybody hones their craft. But it was so compelling because from the second that show started, you were vested in those characters. And that's something that, uh, uh, you know, I, I think people say, yeah, he, he doesn't get the, the, the science tiny whiny stuff. That was Moffat's, uh, you know, wheelhouse. Really nailed that stuff, especially during the Matt Smith era uh, as Doctor. Was it really cool stuff as to how things and why they were happening and, and it was stories and plots within plots within plots. I don't come into the Davies era again really expecting that level of complexity uh, uh, or, or, or that type of storytelling. But just as we had sort of hoped as the specials were getting going, was it going to have the, the the second side of Doctor Who, which was the heart? Um, or maybe Doctor Who has two hearts. That's the point. Hearts. You know, you have, you have the two stories, you have the two hearts. You know, uh, and the answer is absolutely. You know, you, you care about everybody. And, and I think that's why we haven't you know gone heavy into the new companion, Ruby. I, I'm, I'm already, you know, totally, totally digging it. I, I, I get a little bit of like, more traditional companion vibes this time around. It definitely has that, you know, yeah, we're, we're going back to that sort of field. It's not, it's not Donna, but she was a standout of not being that impressed by the doctor and just sort of being like, okay, well let's fix it. Then this is more the adventure of like, wait, goblins, what? And then the, the moment figuring out, wait, when was, when was Harry Houdini? Wasn't it the 1920s and watching the, the wheels come together and putting the pieces together of like, did I just actually encounter a time traveler? What? They that was so brilliant because she runs down and and you have that scene. You're like, yeah, okay. She wants to go figure out what happened, wants to go, and the, the jacket putting on scene means she's not just going to find out what happened. She wants to go along for the ride now. And he was waiting. The door creaks open. He was waiting. He was sort of like, oh, do I gonna do this again? Yeah, I'm gonna do this again. Um and she didn't say it. She didn't say the yeah. line. She didn't say the Finger line. Finger on the inside. She, but but they telegraphed it. She goes inside, runs back outside. She's like, what? 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 And then runs back inside again, which I thought was such a brilliant way of doing the thing that we know has to be done. You have to say it or you have to imply it. We know it's bigger on the inside. It's going to shock anybody. And they did it so well in that scene. And that left us with the jaw-dropping moment of the fourth wall breaking and the neighbor just going, haven't you ever seen a TARDIS before? And that's when I was just like, uh oh, uh oh, <laughs> something's happening. Uh, this is going to be there's there there's a lot going on. And and of course, I think that plays into who the mother is walking away. And the doctor didn't intervene with that or do anything. I think there are the, the plots and plots, even though at Moffat level, they're going to be interesting and fun. And I think uh, we got a taste of that at the end because who's the neighbor? Who is that? And who yeah, is so Mrs. Let's, Flood? Yeah, who is Mrs. Flood? So let's talk about uh, uh, these two mysteries. Are <laughs> is it Mrs. Theories. Flood or Miss um, Flood? Mrs. Flood, the neighbor played by Anita Dobson. Do we have any theories on who she is? I have a theory that's kind of. I, I want to hear it. I want to hear this theory because then I have to tell you what my, my yes, husband's no, I, theory is. I, well, so. This isn't from any spoilers or anything, but it is informed from... I'm on uh, the Discord for TARDIS Arudatorum, and there's um, been a lot of, of chatter on there from Elizabeth Sandifer about this. She thinks it's Susan. She also thought the one who waits was Susan, will be Susan, because she, she's been waiting for her grandfather to return ever since she left the TARDIS and the Daleks master plan. And there's something with all the talk of abandoned children and there's a big emphasis on found family and all that stuff in this episode. So thematically, it just all kind of lines up. Mm. And also, 
the fourth wall breaking. The only other character that w- has ever had the power to break the fourth wall has been the Doctor himself. Was the Doctor, yeah. So without being the Doctor, the closest you could get to someone that may plausibly have that ability would be Susan, his granddaughter. So I don't know. I don't know. Like, like, and there was something. Russell T. Davies showed up to the premiere of the first special with Carol Ann Ford on his arm, which I thought was weird. So I don't know. <laughs> I don't know anything. <laughs> I don't know anything. Crumbs. But I feel like there's a non-zero chance that Mrs. Flood is Susan. So it's a weird name, though. Mrs. Flood, to me, just evokes like River Song and Amy Pond. I feel mm-hmm. like there's something hidden in that name that I can't figure out. Oh, this kind of piggybacks on uh, the theory that that Ruby is Rose and the alternative 10th Doctor in the alternate universe is that that's Ruby is their daughter. Uh, you have Ruby, Red, Rose, Red. Um, the parents couldn't be found. You know, um, so, I mean, I was thinking... Well, it's not so far off. It could. It's, I mean, it's Doctor Who. And somehow it's their daughter. You know, your parents aren't could not be found. I mean, they're, they couldn't be found because they're in another universe. But that's anyway, wild. that's that. That's a good theory. That makes a lot of sense. My only thing against it is that I can't... I don't know how deeply, like into the lore Russell is going to go. I mean, I feel like that's like a real deep cut, no? Oh, but that said, like, it makes complete sense. Yeah. <laughs> right. I mean, like, it's a good theory. Um, huh. I can't help but feel like the mysterious mother figure, robed figure who drops off her baby, I can't help but feel like it's Ruby herself from Ruby the future. Ruby doing it herself? Yeah. Is that like so obvious? No, that's uh, not far off, actually. Because, John, you mentioned the doctor pointedly decides not to go see who it is. And he knows that he knows Ruby is dying to find out who it is. Um, The only reason he would not is if he knows who it is and doesn't want to interfere. Yeah, I told him that when he was going back, he said, I forgot something. I thought it was going to be to go find out who the mother is, you know, um, but instead, it was to save. Uh, uh, yeah, he had to save Davina McCall from uh, getting who I I, I, have, so, I did not, us, uh, while Day. watching this as an American realize was uh, was the real host of that show. I looked it up afterwards. I was like, that's hilarious because I was like, are they really going to let that character die that way? I mean, that's not for a Christmas special. You have a Christmas tree, you know, <laughs> fold somebody <laughs> mercilessly, uh, and then the fact that it was actually a real host. Of one of those shows, I'm like, well, of course, the doctor had to, had to save it. And I, and I thought that was just a lot of that. That again was a lot of the, uh, you know, let's tie this all in together as a big, uh, as a big episode. Uh, and Ooh, and didn't big... she also lend her voice in the 2005 reboot? Um, Davina oh. Bot. Yeah, the Davina Bot. Yeah, and not to be pedantic, pedantic. I think that's the right word I'm looking for, Josh. Is but yeah, didn't Susan leave in Invasion of the Daleks instead of the Daleks Master Plan, which is what. Barbara and Ian left at the end of just. Oh, yes, you're right. Except the Daleks invasion of Earth, because there's no story called invasion of the Daleks. Invasion. Yeah, see, that's <laughs> <laughs> I feel really bad for speaking ill of the Chibnall years because I don't know. I feel badly about that. Jody Maybe was great. Jody was great. And the fugitive doctor whole, that whole thing was great. I think it was just a very muddy, very just. I think the first series of of Jody's was so getting away; they didn't want to bring back any returning villains, uh, monsters, things, and it just wanted to be its own. So it was very, it was very much like a Twilight Zone version of Doctor Who or Black Mirror episodes or Black Mirror Doctor Who. Um, it it just. It, it was Doctor Who in, in name, and and I yeah, too many cooks in the kitchen with all those companions too. But yeah, I, I get what you're saying. I, I don't like to besmirch it, but it is my least favorite. I think that's the beauty of fandom, is that you have bumpy eras. Um, you have people who otherwise are very talented 
uh, creative individuals who may not either be the right fit or may not or may have just missed the mark. Um, and we all know that's happened. I mean, how many times that happened in, a, in an entire season of Star Trek? We we're just like, wow, that entire season didn't work. Um, and or close to, or close to it, depending on the show. And so that can happen. And we can sort of like get past that. What's really neat is that this is this is a show that has that kind of natural built in regeneration, as one might say, uh, to get us to the next level of where we're, we're getting this like, you know, a, a clean slate. And now we have now we have it. Uh, I'm, I just I'm, I'm really sort of I'm mystified by why I like it so much, but why I simultaneously why it does feel like coming home again. And, uh, you know, and because it is it is this like high definition, high budget vibe to it that and, and feel that we didn't have before, because when I was going back and watching some of the 10th Doctor, my memory did not recall the graininess and the fact that it was in standard definition. It was not at all shot in high definition. And yeah, David Tennant looked like a child. He looked like a baby. And I never saw him that way. I always saw him as like, well, I guess he was a youngish doctor. But now looking at side by side, I'm like, wow, which maybe the last half years were. And guy, I saw you earlier. I saw you earlier. We were making the reference to 2005. And then all of a sudden I saw you doing the math. You're, you're like, you were out loud doing the math and we all went, oh, that that was a long time ago. It was. That was a long time ago. And by the time the new series officially starts, it will have been 19 years since uh, uh, the reboot occurred. Reboot. So that is really, uh, that's really quite quite a time to both bring actors back, but also sort of come back with what we what we have now. And that's, that's just sort of blown my mind but here we here we are again i mean R- ruby feels feels like rose but feels like her own character feels feels actually in some ways um like a the same youthfulness as rose same like age same sort of you know uh, 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 economic background um but a little more self-assured you know you know and, and i think that comes from that family structure that they that they're building this episode which is that Yes, she is a, as they say, a foundling, um, but was, but has a real family. You know, that is her mother, that is her grandmother, and the 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 enthusiasm and brightness with which she was doing things, even while having all the bad luck. I mean, I drop one bag in the day, and I am just going to be pouting for six hours. Um, she had goblins messing with her for three weeks and was still pretty cheery and just like getting on with it. And, and that energy was something that I see from a character like that, who's had a, had a bit of a rough start, questions about their beginning, but an incredibly supportive family environment and people who made it very clear that, yep, you are a valid, loved human being. And now she's, as a result, the ideal companion to go off to the doctor who himself is now in that position, having, you know, healed because of the work of the 14th Doctor, which is technically ongoing, sort of in the same timeline. I mean, they're neighborhoods apart at this point, I'm guessing, you know? Uh, but, you know, so now they're d- these two very feeling powerful people about to go out into the universe. That's the that's the sense I'm getting now, is that they're not um, babes in the wood. These are actually going to be some pretty powerful people to reckon with, you know, once they find themselves in the other end of time or wherever they end up. Was I the only one who got subtle Clara vibes off of Ruby? Oh, literally have the note. I have the note written down for that. Complete Clara vibes too. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I think I think it's there. It's an aesthetic feel too. Yeah. But there is also that like kind of self assuredness that Rose lacked, and there's also I couldn't help but notice like this is really Russell T Davies doing post Stephen Moffat Doctor Who, mm-hmm. like the thing with the crack reminded me of the eleventh hour. The whole thing where the companion meets the doctor as a baby and then goes on to travel with the doctor like that sort of resonated with the 11th hour. The The way that the companion is, she has a mystery. She's like she's like a, a puzzle that needs to be solved herself. So and also in Clara's introductory episode where she joined the show proper, I'm not talking about where she was souffle girl inside oh, the doll. St. John. Yeah, that whole thing with her her parents meeting and the leaf and something about chance or fate reminded me very much of Ruby with 
coincidence and bad luck and like the power of coincidence and all that stuff. So I don't know. It just seemed I'm not saying that that Russell T. Davies was inspired necessarily, but there are things that kind of reverberate throughout the show. And it's clear he's been watching. He's been watching uh, uh, the show, Um, you know, which is interesting because I feel like watching the Chibnall years, I felt like Chris Chibnall stopped watching after Matt Smith. Yeah. It was just the vibe that I got. I felt like there was nothing that the show had introduced in season eight, nine, ten that felt like was engaged with or acknowledged in the Chibnall years. I could be wrong. Again, I don't mean to cast aspersions, but I feel like I keep talking shit about Chris Chibnall's time on the show. And I don't I as much as I keep saying I don't want to Listen, do that. I you have your own that. trauma to work out here. You know, that's, that's yeah. Oh, God. That's, that, that, <laughs> we all went through that. Do you think that there was any like the the focus on coincidences and luck that had a lot of that, you know, and even the way they're about, you know, the language of rope. There was a lot of stuff over the over the years where they talk about, you know, almost these mystical things, but then they end up being grounded in, well, yeah, the probability. And what does probability mean? Uh, and, and it's sort of fun. They get to play with that. So, you know, that's that's where we are with this. What I loved about that was they let it, and what he, what, because he says, the doctor says, honestly, he says, so wait, are goblins responsible for all accidents? I, I don't know. Maybe they are. And I, I sat there laughing. I was like, you know what? That would that would actually just make sense. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, that line was great. And that also shows like how the doctor's mind works. And it also kind of shows like it's sort of a depiction of that thing that I was talking about earlier, where to watch Doctor Who, it's kind of it's kind of exercising your imagination. Like you need to have the kind of mind that will encounter that question and then just say, yeah, maybe. And then go from there. But the flip side of that moment you just described was the line toward the end of the episode where the doctor is is i think speaking to mrs flood and he he wonders aloud he's like am i the one who brings the bad luck he I still has that doubts was very ominous he still has doubts he's not he's not perfect i think that was the point is that he's uh, he, he may have healed uh the doctor heal thyself but he didn't uh become flawless uh and those and those doubts will still be there um but he he does what you're supposed to do he quickly conquers his doubts because he's like, wait, am I the bad luck? And you even get the sense like, is he about to just like run off and leave yeah. uh, and leave Ruby? No, he 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 stays there with the TARDIS and opens up the door. Uh, uh, so so that was that was sort of the the throwback to like he's still the doctor. He's still going to question himself and and good because otherwise he'd, they'd really be in trouble. Uh, uh, the doctor always gets into the most trouble when. Uh, uh, they begin to think of themselves as a, a god. That that was the brilliance of Tennant's end run, and there, and and one of those specials uh, uh, towards towards the end of that was uh, what, what was it called? What what was the episode? It was the one on Mars? Yeah, Waters, Waters of Mars. Mars. Yeah, and that was where you know it, it was the Doctor, the Doctor triumphant, the Doctor you know can, can do anything is going to go around time fixing everything, and yeah, that doesn't work out. Does that doesn't work when you know you, you need that humbleness, that bit, bit of that bit of doubt, that bit of questioning, uh, and and openness, and that's that's where we are. But some confidence, cool, and this and there's and I use this term I think in a in the in the complimentary way. There's a swagger, you know, that the doctor has now that comes with that kind of confidence. Uh, and I, I was reading that uh, there isn't going to be a one set wardrobe. Uh, where there, there are going to be you know, some wardrobe changes between episodes, and it's going to be well, you know, what are we going to manifest today and what's 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 that going to be and i'm i'm ex- I'm excited for that because i think they're taking advantage of this actor's talents and capabilities you're talking about the musical you know the musical aspect to it um if you got it use it you know if, if they can sing if if these two actors can sing use it you know ma- ma- make it part of it because it's really uh, something we haven't seen before but i don't think that was that was really part of uh you know the the casting calls in the past. So I think for this, there might have been some of that. Like you know, are you are they more multifaceted? Bring Neil Patrick Harrison as as the villain, as a toy maker. Uh, well, he became an actor that was very multifaceted. You know, really good at physical, uh, 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 you know, acting and humor and dancing and everything else. So I think we're going to get more of that this season, which is very fitting the Disney brand. You know, Disney Disney wants that 
I would I would think it's very Disney. Lots of dancing things, lots of moving things, lots of <laughs> you know stuff to wow us. So I think we're going to get more of that this season. And if you said that you got a musical episode, uh, go with it. Star Trek pulled it off, uh, you know, and I just. Uh, goes all the way back to Buffy as far as I'm concerned and you can, you can you can really have a lot of fun with that. He can also, you know, it can be bad, but I think I think when I the actors are having fun, it still works. The the audience has fun. And that was what we were again missing in the previous era was where, where was that fun? Where where was the, you know, the joy from the actors were they actually, you know, having a good time on set? I also want to just briefly mention because I thought it was really fascinating that scene with the police officer, which is a great scene, was written and shot in response to a Disney note. They said that they they tested the episode and they felt that the audience should see the doctor sooner. So Russell T. Davies went off and wrote that scene. What's so brilliant about that, though, is that, and this is what a good writer does, what a good producer does, he took the note and then he he ran with it. He sketched out this nothing little character, but made you really care and gave the doctor that great Sherlock Holmes moment of deduction where you get a scene of the doctor being very doctorish and very impressive and sweet and, you know, kind of evocative of um, Paul McGann in the TV movie where he was telling everyone their future. But yeah, that scene exists because of a Disney note and what a good writer producer does is they take the spirit of the note, but then they spin it into something. And like the fact that that scene was singled out as like such a great scene and a great moment. I mean, you know, it was, it was, it was wonderful. It was a really wonderful moment. Did you guys see the trailer for series one? I guess we're calling it season one. Was it the full trailer? It was just, I, I just got the little like that it's coming. Was there, was there something I missed? Yeah, if you go on YouTube, you can watch the oh, okay. uh, the trailer for the season. I mean, there wasn't anything in it that I found really spoilery, but the energy was there, the vibe was there, and I'm just really psyched. I can't believe we have to wait till May. I thought it was going to be like It'll April. come fast. It'll come back. I know. I know. It always does. Any closing thoughts before before I close this out? Yeah. Why so didn't we fix the cracks? Yeah, that's a They're good They're still point. there. That's it's a... really cold in that. In, 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 I want to know what happens to the cracks. That's a good point. Maybe the sonic screwdriver doesn't do plaster. I don't know. It doesn't do drywall. Um... I, I, I bet you there's going to be, there's going to be, a, there's a reason for that. There's going to be a recurring, a recurring thing about that. We're going to find out. But I'm still like, really? You didn't, you left, it's Christmas and you left them with a crack in the that's house. The Doctor, you, you could have come point. up with something. He's busy. He's got places to go, <laughs> things to see. By the way, I love the Houdini reference uh, because that hot summer with Houdini, because I watched it recently, but um, John Pertwee's third doctor mentioned that he he was friends with Houdini. So now I'm imagining John Pertwee was the one that had that hot summer with Houdini, which uh, <laughs> and, <laughs> I think is- And was it just because of, it was hot outside or was it a hot I mean, summer? I mean, he had a little smirk. That I can't line reading was suggestive. The, I can't wait to see the collective like naysayers' heads explode over their interpretation of that one line. Ugh. Yeah, well, there also seemed in the trailer to me to be some. some oh, I know tension between tension. Billy and Jonathan Groff. Yeah, so the naysayers should just wait. I guess. I think they're leaning so heavily into the uh, uh, the controversy side in a way that is also showing how silly it is um and and i think that you know you you have a lot of choices in how to deal with it but this is this is sort of where where i'm feeling like they're going with it which is just like yeah lean into it uh poke the bear a bit because what do you have to lose uh we, we if you do anything you lose to begin with so let's just go all in on it and sort of hoping that that sort of you know, bad response yeah. burns itself out real quick, uh, which I think will happen because I just I'm getting I'm getting this flashbacks to the introduction of Captain Jack and later on Torchwood, where there there was some pretty heavy pushback. Um, and that now it's just like, yeah, I mean, that, that's Russell Davis saying, I'm going to go ahead with this. Come along with me if you if if you want. And, and I think we are not going to be surprised to how many people do still come along. They'll grumble about it. And I can't believe they're doing this. But hey, if you write a good story, uh, you write a good doctor, 
you, you, you make the companions compelling and interesting and the, and the journey's fun, pe people are going to watch. Uh, that's 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 what it all comes down to, is that if it's, if it's good enough, people are going to watch even if they find themselves offended. I've been offended at countless things and have been like, well, that was still good. I'll watch, you know, so. Yeah, I mean, if it's good, it's good. And, you know, maybe ideally those people who may be offended by certain things but are still compelled because the show is good, maybe it will help them get over those hang-ups about things that they are struggling with. I mean, I think that's why they're there in the first place, is to normalize all this and be like, guys, it's not a big deal. What are we doing? I think. Yeah. Well, if there's nothing else, that's all for us this week. We'll definitely be returning along with the show in May, and perhaps we will have some new episodes in the interim, depending on how Trash Compactor and my life go. But to be the first to find out, please follow and subscribe to TARDIS Rubbish on Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube. I want to thank my guests, John, Guy, and Jack. You're all beautiful women, probably. And <laughs> until next time, laugh hard, run fast, and be kind. <laughs> <laughs>